it's a blessing. All right, if you will turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Looked at this morning into uh, a great passage of Scripture. I think that uh, will become one of your favorites. And as I was studying this week, of course, we started um, in the Gospel of John when I came. And uh, at that time, the Lord's Supper had not been scheduled. But as I studied this week, and uh, of course, we've scheduled it for next Sunday, so I want to encourage everyone to be here for that. But I, as I studied this week, I thought, wow, this is wonderful that this message and this study so uh, prepares our heart for the Lord's Supper next week. And uh, I'd like to say that I planned that, but I didn't plan that. That was the Lord. So uh, uh, what, a, what an encouragement uh, that is. And so maybe that will speak to your heart today. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also uh, was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there was six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they, took it, they, so they took it, and when the master of the feast test, tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you might speak to us now from your word, that we might see Christ and him glorified that our hearts might be drawn to Him, that You might, uh, Lord, work in us by the power of Your Spirit and the Word of God, a faith in Christ. Help us, Lord, to see Him as He truly is, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament promised. Father, we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, at first, uh, you might think... What an interesting story to start out the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was my thought years ago when I first studied this passage. I thought, now this is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. And it starts by Jesus going to a wedding, and they ran out of wine, and Jesus miraculously turns water into wine. And, of course, the text, it almost makes it sound like this was happenstance, but, of course, we know that nothing happens by happenstance, that this was all planned by God. And so, you know, we, we might think, what an insignificant miracle to prove that Jesus, uh, or to open Jesus' miraculous ministry, His public ministry. We would expect something maybe more grandiose, more majestic than a perfunctory Jewish wedding that ran out of wine in the seven, day, seven days of feasting. But we would be wrong there, and, and I was wrong there in my preconceptions, because there is no such thing as an insignificant miracle. 
That's contradictory in itself. So we, we must stop and begin to think, okay, if this is miraculous, and if this is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus, then there's something here more, you might say, than just uh, Jesus and his family were at a wedding and they ran out of wine and they needed more wine. And so Jesus was able to uh, conveniently turn uh, gallons of water into gallons of wine. Uh, this is more than just a need to make sure that we don't become embarrassed uh, at the wedding feast having run out of the necessary things that, that you have to provide uh, as a family like this. And so now we have to think deeper about this. We need to understand why did John put this here? Why is the Holy Spirit using this particular miracle in the life and public ministry of Jesus to introduce Christ to the world. And I think the more we scratch at that, the more we begin to realize that there is, there is a lot of symbolism in this passage. That there's more to the running out of wine and the creation of wine than meets the eye. And that is brought about by fulfilling a, a wedding ceremony feast. And so, in fact, you know, that's why I've entitled this message, you know, Has Your Religion Run Dry? Because in reality, this passage, uh, it's, it serves almost as a, as a demonstration, a metaphor of something much greater. You might see the wedding as the religious scene of the day. Judaism. And Judaism had become perfunctory. It had, it had come, as uh, A.W. Pink says, Judaism still existed as a religious system. There were pur purifications and religious rites and, and so forth, but it ministered no comfort to the heart. It had degenerated into cold, mechanical routine, utterly destitute of joy in God. You see, Judaism had come down to the rules and rituals. And, and so the Messiah, the very Messiah we will find as we go through the book of John, the very Messiah, the, the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament is standing before the religious rulers and they don't even see it. In fact, the more they think He might actually be the Messiah, the more angry they become that He is disrupting their religious power over the people. They're not joying in God. They are reveling in their religious uh, power while the people languish and die. Empty religion. Empty religion that had run dry, that was void of the living God and the fresh waters that come from loving Him and joying in Him and believing His promises and His Word. That's what was going on. And that's what we'll see in this passage. And you know, I say this, you know, we might not in, in America or, or around the world, the church might not be facing so much empty religion in Judaism, but we face empty religion on al almost every front. We face empty religion in all kinds of false religions around the world. And we, could, we used to be able to say that most of those were around the world, but the truth is they're not around the world anymore. They're in our backyard. They're in our neighborhoods. They're down the street from us. As America, uh, and, I, and I'm not just preaching to America, I'm, I'm saying really uh, not so much America. The church has languished in empty religion as liberalism has, has filtered into and, and gotten into the congregations across this land. It has sapped the power. It has drained the belief. It has turned things that were once lively and believing, things that were once filled with joy, worship services that joyed in God and, and relied on God's Word and proclaimed the Gospel. It now has put a, a damp cloth on that and is killing the fire of the church and stifling it. And many young people have abandoned the church of Jesus Christ in America and, and in Europe because they come to services and they see nothing. 
They see empty ritualism. They see uh, people that no longer know the, the presence of God, the power of God, the joy of God, the trust in God's Word, and the power of transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's happening. This is as for us today, every bit as it, mu- as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ came. This passage shows us how much we need the fresh wine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what's happening in this passage. A couple of things, uh, three points that I want to just bring out to you uh, that, that's, that I see in this passage, uh, that this story that would be easy to overlook if we just read it uh, in the historical account way, uh, which it is a historical account, but it's a historical account that, that John means for us to see spiritual significance in. And so the first one is, Jesus is greater than all the people at the wedding. Jesus is greater than all the people of the wedding. Now think about this. We're reading this story. This is in the Holy Scriptures. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And what do we see? When you tell a story, what is one of the key elements of stories? Detail. Without detail, they tend not to be believable. They're, they tend not to be interesting. But when you can say, well, you know, I, I, for example, my Baptist history professor when I was in college, he was such a great Baptist uh, history teacher. And he had traveled, he was an evangelist, he had traveled all over the United States and probably some other countries. But, but when he, he would uh, teach Baptist history, you know, he might talk about some church in New York or, you know, Pennsylvania or something like that, and he would, he would, he loved to fish, and so he would say, well, you know, this church is right here, and, and, uh, you know, the pastor was preaching over here, and there was hundreds of people saved, and they did a baptism, he said, and I, you know, I such and such to go this right here, and over here's a good crappy pond, and, you know, and he would do that kind of, this guy made it so real. He gave the details. It wasn't just some list of pastors and churches and people being saved in a number of baptisms in some town that we had ever, we'd never been to. But he had been there. He had seen those churches. He knew what they looked like. He could tell you there was a good fishing spot right down the street from that church. You see, detail. But when we look in this passage, ask them questions. Think about it. Who is the groom? We don't know. Who's the bride? We don't know. Who's the superintendent or the, or the master of the ceremony? We don't know. For that matter, Jesus' mother's not even named. Which, by the way, I mean, that is sort of a, uh, a thing that John does. Mary was his, actually his aunt. And so John typically refers to, he doesn't want to refer to her many times by name. And so scholars have noticed that in the book of John. It's sort of a, um, a, a humbling way. He'll refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so when John refers to a family member of Jesus, he, he tends to want to minimize their name. But at the same time, it's still significant to notice that we're talking about a wedding ceremony here that's being recorded in the Bible, and we don't know who the bridegroom is. We don't know who the bride is. We don't know who the master of the ceremony is. And, and of course, they're all mentioned. We're not sure how the relationship is. Why is Mary here? Why is Jesus here? Why are his disciples here? Why is Jerry, uh, uh, Mary uh, you know, bothered by them running out of wine? That meant that in some way she was responsible or she was partly responsible. So we might gather from that that maybe this was a family member of Mary. This was possibly a family member of Jesus. But we really really don't know, do we? Because it just doesn't say. And what what would John, why would John tell us in such a way as that? Because Jesus is greater than the groom. This story is not about the wedding. 
It's not really about the groom. You know how that is, you know. It's not about the bride. And that the way the wedding is, you know, in our culture, you know, it's all about the bride. But not here. Not in this story. It's not about the groom. It's not about the family of the groom. It's not about the wedding of the, the bride. It's not about any of those people. Jesus is greater than the groom. He's greater than the ruler of the feast. He's greater than Mary. He is greater than the circumstance that arrives in this situation. Now this is, of course, uh, a Middle Eastern culture, and a Jewish wedding would run for, uh, I think they said, about seven days. So you can, you can imagine what that's like, that uh, you've got a wedding ceremony that's going on for seven days at the groom's home, usually, is the way they understand that. And so during that time, there's lots of feasting and, and eating and dancing and all the types. If you've ever seen uh, know, a modern Jewish wedding, is not the same as, as an ancient one, but there are, you, know, you see some of the festivities that are going on. Well, this is the kind of thing that's happening. And it was a great dishonor to run out of wine before the wedding feast was over. And so Mary begins to see, we're running out. And so she goes to Jesus and tells him this situation. And Jesus responds to her, you know, uh, and his answer. Look in verse 9. He says, or, or the scripture says here, so I can find my verse. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Go back and see where Jesus and Mary converse. He says, she says, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, which is not a term of disrespect, that now today in our culture that might sound very disrespectful, but that's not in his culture. It was, it, there's some things happening here that uh, Jesus, when he's speaking to his mother, that you might say he's the word woman here in that culture and in that time is sort of like saying uh, lady, you know, lady, you know, that sort of thing. Now, why would he do that? And she clearly did not take offense because as soon as he's finished speaking, she says, do whatever he says. Okay? She's not offended. This was a common way uh, for him to speak to his mother, except for he did not call her mother, which might be significant. There may be some, some, some separation here in the sense of, you know, can I paraphrase and say, in other words, He's starting his public ministry. Mary is coming to him like his mother and saying, we're out of wine. And he says, woman, in other words, there needs to be a little bit of separation here now. I'm no longer just your, your boy, your son. It's a public ministry. It's a different day. Jesus is greater than Mary. Jesus is greater than the groom. He's greater than the feast. He's greater than the circumstances. Empty religion places a wrong emphasis on individuals. Oftentimes, think about it. You think about, you know, Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, gurus in Hinduism and the New Age movement, Muhammad, Buddha. One time I was, uh, when I was in college, I had, uh, or right before I went to college, I I had a job, I was doing carpet cleaning with a company, and uh, I was in this one home, and, and on, on this table, there were all these little, uh, little idols on the table, or little figures, and then across the table were a bunch of pictures, and they were all of, of Hindu gurus, and in the middle was a picture of what you and I would think of, sort of the Leonardo da Vinci Jesus, you know. 
And so, you know, we cleaned and all that. And on the way out, we began to talk to her and, and said, you know, I see what you've got going here, you know, with sort of a devotional place. This is your sort of altar, a place of worship. But what I'm confused about is why do you have Jesus in the center? And she says, well, these are all enlightened teachers. And Jesus is one of the most enlightened ones. But the truth is, that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus is not the most enlightened. Jesus is God's Son. He's the Son of God. There is no one beside Him. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity. The one God in three persons. Jesus is greater than that. But all false religion, all cults, almost always find some person to focus around rather than the truth. Empty religion has a tendency to elevate the person, an individual oftentimes, whether it be Joseph Smith or Mary Baker Eddy, you know, Muhammad, or even Buddha. Oftentimes these are elevated above the truth of God. But Christ is God's Son. Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And it is through Christ that we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. God did His own work. He didn't need any of those people. He, he did it Himself. God is both the just one and the justifier of those that come to Him through Jesus Christ. God didn't need the help of any man. God did it Himself through His own Son, Jesus Christ. Then number two, Jesus is greater, number one, than, than all the people at the wedding. But number two, Jesus is greater than creation. Look in this passage. He says that, that we see in verse 3 through 5, he says, uh, uh, well, the Scripture says, when the, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My I were has not come, has not yet come. His mother said to, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there's debate on what, what's actually happening here. But it is very clear that, that Mary recognizes who Jesus is. Mary is clear. She goes to him in this moment of crisis and says, we're out of wine. Mary is expecting, she realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. She knows better than anybody. She also knows that He is God and that He is able to do something miraculous here. And Jesus, sort of a very slight and I think warm and loving, but yet a rebuke, says, It's not my time. And what does he mean by that? Because there's a sense, as I was studying through this, kind of wrestling through, it was like, well, it, 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 it's not his time. In the book of John, the hour, my hour, usually refers to his death, burial, and resurrection. It is, it is a reference to the death of Christ primarily, the sufferings and death of Christ. And so in that sense, it is not Christ's hour. He's not getting ready to be arrested and beaten and, and crucified. But what is Jesus talking about here? Because this is the beginning of his public ministry. So in, in one sense, yes, it is his hour. This is the beginning of his messianic ministry showing that he is the Messiah that the Old Testament has prophesied about. So what is he talking about? Why does he say this to Jesus? And what it becomes clear is that he's saying to her, this is this sort of subtle separation, that, that he is saying to her, she's kind of wanting to continue their relationship as mother-son. And he is saying to her, I, I can't be that to you anymore. The Father sets the hour. Not her, not even Jesus. And he says that, that the Father sets those times. We'll see that as we go through the book of John. 
And so Jesus is saying to Mary, she's, she's expecting a miracle. She understands that this is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. Jesus, do something. And he's saying to her, don't pressure me in that sense. It was time for Mary to understand that my son is the Messiah, not just my son. He was born of the Virgin Mary. This man is miraculous. He's the God-man. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. Mary recognized that Jesus was able to turn water into wine. I don't think she had that in mind. I don't think she knew anything. I, I think she just knew Jesus was the answer. But she didn't know how. She looked at the, at the, at the servants and she said, do whatever he tells you. She, I don't think she had any idea what Jesus was going to do. But she understood that Jesus was the answer. And Jesus says, fill the water pots. And Jesus exercises his authority over his creation and miraculously changes water into wine, proving that he is, in fact, the creator. The creator. Jesus demonstrates it in verses 6 through 8. He performs this amazing miracle of changing water into wine. And then John wants you and me to understand that. John wants us to see that Christ, this is the beginning of the Messiah's public ministry. This is the beginning of Jesus. And we're going to see that John gives us a series of historical accounts. Each one of them is meant to show and demonstrate that Jesus is who John says he is in the first chapter of John. John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, he says. And then he says, okay, let me show you that in action. And he begins to show us one story after another, proving that what he said about Jesus at the beginning of the book of John is in fact truth, that Jesus is the Word, the, the, the living God. And so John wants you and me to see that Christ is the fulfillment of that. He wants them to see that the empty religion of Judaism is, has run its course. It has come to the end. It's full of nothing but empty rituals and legal statutes and empty traditionalism now. Why? Because it fulfilled its purpose. It brought Israel to the point that the Messiah has now come. And I want to tell you, and, and we need to understand, that empty religion is not good for anybody, even in our day. And beloved, if you and I know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and the Word of God is in our hearts, then we need to understand we have the truth. We have the message. There's no reason for men and women and boys and girls to waste their eternity and their lives in empty religion. Jesus Christ is the life, the way, the truth, and the life. Look with me that Jesus is greater than the creation. In fact, empty religion always belittles Jesus and overly elevates creation. Look with me in Romans. Keep your finger there in John and turn to Romans chapter 1. Empty religion always belittles Jesus, lowers Jesus in estimation, in authority, in position, in essence, and exalts the creation. And in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul points this out. In verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This, is, this passage is referring to the pagan lost world. And Paul is saying, what happened? It's as if someone said, what happened to man? And Paul is answering that question. How man left the true God and began to go into false religion, empty religion, and all of the debauchery and sin that goes with that. And he says, Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth? 
For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Always false religion lowers our estimation of Jesus Christ and, and elevates our understanding and devotion to the creation, whether it be man, whether it be creatures, or created or mythological beings of our own imaginations. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dis undesirable or, or dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged their natural uh, relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. You see this, he says, this false religion, this empty religion, which is beginning to permeate this country, this worry about we can, you know, murder innocent unborn children but spend billions of dollars to save the planet this is false religion and believe me it is religion okay don't take it for anything else it's not ecology it is religion and this is why those people have such devotion to it it's religious devotion and I say that with as much compassion as I can come up with. As, as I'm not trying to belittle. I'm trying to plead that they understand that that is a false religion. There is no hope in that. There is no salvation in that. It doesn't matter if you save the planet. And by the way, the planet's not yours to save. It's an elevation of creation so that we might dishonor the Creator. Jesus comes as the life and the light of men, as John says. And the light and light of men is the Creator, and He's greater than the creation. And He demonstrates it here by changing water into wine, as if it were nothing. And then lastly, Jesus is greater than empty religion. He's greater than all the false religions out there. And you know, it, it's heartbreaking. Uh, we lived, uh, back in Atlanta, we lived across the street from a cultic church. And so when we first moved in, we had wave after wave of, of representatives come from that church to, to try to win us over. And you've got to respect their zeal. You've got to respect their, their, their desire to reach others. I, I mean, I do respect that. And on, on several occasions, I was able to talk to some of their representatives. And, 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 and I can remember, you know, I, 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 I came out on the steps and, and we talked for probably 30, 40 minutes. And I let them give their whole spill and their whole, their whole thing. And then when they finished, you know, I, I, I said, you know, I, I want you to know that I'm a pastor. And I've let you say all that, not because I want to trap you or anything, but because I want to give you the opportunity to tell me everything that you believe you need to tell me. I want you to be able to speak and have your say. And now I would like to talk to you about what the Bible says about what you had to say. And on several occasions, you know, I, I could see, you know, had the veteran here who's, you know, stalwart and not going to be moved out of their cultic beliefs. And, and beside them, which is their tendency to put a, a novice there, you know, so here's the stalwart and here's the novice, the young person that really doesn't really know much about it, and yet they've been kind of lured into this maybe, and, 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 and I could see the young one many times hanging on my words and, and asking questions. My heart is breaking. 
because they're in chains, in false religion, in empty religion, not knowing the true God, not having the comfort and the joy of the true God in Jesus Christ. And hearing it, you can see them begin to be pulled toward it. And see the veteran begin to, well, we need to go. And begin to cut off and talk over me and try to stop me from speaking. And I just prayed as they left, Lord, Your Word can do the work. And prayed for them that God would continue to do and work in the seeds that had been planted there. But we need to understand that Jesus Christ is greater than these religions. He is greater than false religions that Satan has gotten people in chains in and in darkness. God wants them to have life and light, forgiveness of sins and eternal life through Jesus Christ. He introduced it. You say, well, Scott, how do you see that? Well, John's got a pattern here. In chapter 1, verse 15, uh, 19 through 28, he introduced the false religions of the Jews or the empty religion of the Jews. These are the people that came to John the Baptist and said, you know, by whose authority are you preaching? Who sent you? These are the religious authorities that, that had no reality in their, in their spiritual life. They weren't looking for the Messiah. They weren't confessing their sins. These are the same people who stood over, the Bible says, and, and watched the publican who beat upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. While they prayed and said, well, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. These are the people that Jesus and John the Baptist said they were vipers. And Jesus said they're like whited sepulchers, whited graves, beautiful graves with full of dead men's bones. They look great. All the religious paraphernalia, everything around them that looks beautiful, but inside they are rotten and dead and not know, full of darkness and not knowing the true and living God and hiding it from men. And God's Word says that in Jesus Christ, the old religion had run out of wine, you might say. But the Son of God had come here, and He was going to turn and make new wine. And it's not a mistake that the master of the feast said, you know, in most of these marriage feasts, you serve the good stuff first, and as people have eaten and drank and all that, you, you serve the stuff that's not so good. But you've saved the best for last. And the servants standing there knew where that wine had come from. They had watched Jesus turn the water into wine. They had brought that wine over to the master of the feast. The master, watched the master of the feast drink that wine and watched the master of the feast say, this is better than the beginning. And what does John want you and me to get from that? What does the Holy Spirit want you and me to get from that? Don't go back to the empty religion. Don't go back to any of that stuff. It's run its course. Jesus Christ is God's best. Jesus Christ is God's answer. Jesus Christ is God's fulfillment. This is where it was all supposed to lead to. It's the end of all of that. And that was going to be a valuable message to the, to the church as it went forward in Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, in, the, in church history. Now quickly, I want to wrap up and read to you Romans chapter 3, verse 21. If you will turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Now, if you're taking notes, you could also put Hebrews chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. But if you're right now, just turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God. What is this about? What is religion about? It is about eternal life. It is about knowing God. It is about having peace with God and knowing that whatever happened to you, if you walked out these doors and dropped dead, that you have an eternity. That's what it's about. 
Don't let religion and everything, I mean, and, and entertainment and all of those things, don't let those things stop you from thinking about the things that really matter. And that's your eternal soul and destiny. And to be able to do that, we have to have righteousness before God. We have to be rightly related to God. We have to be free of sin and things that hold us back from knowing God. But the, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is none, no, no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. His blood was efficacious to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He passed over the former sins. It was to show the righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Are you stuck in faith, an empty religion? Don't be. Don't be. God wants to know you through Jesus Christ. It's greater. It's fuller. It's the best that God has. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray, Lord, that you would make us, uh, Lord, to see Christ. That you would help us, Lord, to see that all of our empty attempts to fix ourselves are for no avail. Help us, Lord, to forsake all those things and see the love of God in Christ Jesus reaching out to us to see the eternal life, the forgiveness, the knowledge of you that's offered to us by faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. In whose name we pray, amen. As we all stand, you can turn in your hymnal to 210. And if you'd